religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James chapter 1. Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tart podcast. You are joining us in episode four of a series that we are doing on the world. Not the world in terms of like, hey, what's going on in, you know, international politics or not the world in terms of, hey, here's what's happening in, you know, kind of evangelism around the world, but passages that have long sort of both troubled us and sort of perplexed us. What is this thing? thing that the scriptures call the world, and why does even Jesus himself make such a big deal about it? I was reading in John 15 this morning, Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What what is this thing that Jesus is referring to that John and James have such strong things to say about? And that began a series of conversations. So if you haven't caught the rest of those, you might want to go back and grab them. This is episode four. You can certainly jump in with us today and I'm sure benefit from some of the questions we're asking and wondering about. But again, that power of some of these statements in Scripture, James 4, he says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, everyone, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. (laughs) It's like, whoa, them's fighting words. Like, that's pretty strong stuff. So, With me in this episode, Morgan Snyder and Blaine Eldridge, to kind of unpack something new I want to put out there today. But it might be helpful just by way of review. One of the ways we've been talking about the world, trying to characterize it, is it is the cultures, the societies, the economies, the education, the attitudes, values created by fallen humanity doing everything we can to sneak back into Eden to make life work apart from God. Like the world is the Tower of Babel, humanity's attempt to try and make life work apart from God. Um, We called it the flight from reality. And in episode one, we talked about the flight from reality is expressed by this is all there is. This is it. And therefore, maximize convenience, maximize comfort. There's no process. You know, there's no maturation of of human individuals or souls. Like self-driving cars, baby, Starbucks, do everything you can to, to make your world simple. You don't even need to wash your own vegetables. Just get them bagged, you know? And then in episode two, we were talking about like the tattoo and what does that say to us, the post a review, leave a comment phenomenon, and how the world exalts the self. God is not the epicenter of the world. The self is. You are. You are. And then what happens when we let people run with that? Last time, uh, in episode three, we were talking about the assault on our attention and how wow, really substantive that is, and just the myriads of screens and distractions and advertisement and noise and buzz coming at us. And the reason that being problematic is the ability to give our attention to God is the most crucial thing about a human being, and it's where our transformation comes from. So that's a little bit of our history. Welcome to episode four. I've begun each episode with some kind of icon, like what does Starbucks say about the world, or what do tattoos, that kind of thing. The two icons I want to throw out this week and get you guys to riff on, let's react to what do emoticons and the Super Bowl say about us? They're popular, they're widespread, you know, people love them. 
uh, for the most part. And what does that say about the world? What, what insight might we gain from emoticons and the Super Bowl? John, are you talking like specific emoticons, like the poop emoticon? Because I don't want to diss on the poop emoticon. <laughs> that thing is awesome. There's so many appropriate times you, to use the poop you emoticon. You found that one particularly helpful. <laughs> no, we will leave that off the table, literally, for now. <laughs> what do emoticons say about people? Well, the first thing that I think of is how sort of categorically disgusted I was when emoticons were introduced, but also, you know, being some of the last generations here to remember the world before texting when that was like a novelty and then texting wasn't efficient enough. So it was like, can we reduce basic human experiences to little visual cues, get rid of the rest of relating and use those instead? We'll have these little surrogates for the actual ability to engage another person. And I think, like... Disgust is a... That's a strong reaction. Oh, I, I just thought it was totally horrifying that you could get, like, a message, communication from a person and, like, toss back a little thumbs-up hand. Yeah. Of, like... Smiley well, what face. What does that even frown, mean? Frowny like, face. Yeah. But I think where I see those really developing is how they're not just used in texting anymore. There was an emoji movie. There are emoticons used in advertising. There are emoticons used in print magazines. What I see is you build an extremely convenient form that requires like the same emotional vocabulary that my one-year-old has just developed. She can identify happiness and sadness now, which seems to be all that's required of people in order to have relationships on the phone. And then you use that over and over again instead of, you know, having a soul. I still love some of the words you use to describe that, Blaine, of just the surrogate as a word. And I hear you saying the oversimplification. I think what I'm struck by is, uh, we talked about this in past podcasts, is how often we get in trouble texting something that needs to be said face-to-face. -face yes. Because so much is lost. It's just yeah. stripped down to these basic essentials. And it's like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a picture. Yeah. And it gets pixelated and you miss essence. And I think it, what strikes me about the emoticon phenomenon is, um, Blaine, you articulate it so well, and, and, and it's a, a shortcut. I think that's the word I would use. It's simply a shortcut. The ultimate shortcut. And I am convicted of just, you know, just the idea of going way of a culture you know, I personally took a stand. You can ask my wife. I I don't send emoticons because similar, kind of this disdain, of, and I, and I might not even have named it. But then, when the gifts came out of little videos, oh, I was sold because if you can show this little dancing baby, it says more than anything I could say on a text of like, yeah, dude, you're killing it. And and yet, what actually would be integrous? No, no, it's the dancing chihuahua. The dancing chihuahua. Oh, oh that one's seen that, that one's really good. I haven't yeah. seen that. But, John, as you ask that question, I'm aware what would be integrous is to find my friend and be face-to-face -face and give him that hug and do the baby dancing mm -hmm. chihuahua move to just, it's real soul-to-soul -soul relating, and instead, it feels like a shortcut. Yeah, and it's a horrible shortcut. But I have a confession. I did it last week, and thank God, the person that I did it to kind of called me on it. They sent me this beautiful text reacting to all things new. They had just read it or were in the midst of it and like this wonderful, thank you for this. Wow, it's really catching my heart. So appreciate this. And I was in a hurry and I literally just texted back the heart emoticon. You know, I love you. That gives me heart. Whatever I was trying to say through that. And, and they texted back and they're like, really? Really? Like, you, you, that's all you have to say? Okay, so emoticons. We're going to get somewhere with this, folks. Stay with us here. Um, this isn't a podcast about emoticons. What do emoticons and the Super Bowl, let's go to the Super Bowl, say to us, because these are very, very revealing. Super Bowl. Can I go? Can I go? Please can go, I go? Can John. I go? Please connect okay. some dots for me. Right. No, no, no. I'm not a football guy. I admit that. Um, I have other things I watch on TV, but I'm not a football guy. Love March Madness. Love British soccer. Not football guy. 
But I do watch the Super Bowl because it's a phenomenon, right? And a lot of people do. They do it because it is a phenomenon. So much hype and stuff has built it. And I watch it for the commercials, right? You know, these people are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on these commercials. And sometimes it's worth seeing that. Okay, here's the deal. Here's the Super Bowl moment for me. You know, some tight end has um, bruised their pinky in a play and now they're going to the sidelines to Janet. Okay, Janet, what can you tell us? Thank you, Jim. We're down here on the sidelines. And yes, the physios are checking out the pinky finger. <laughs> the pinky finger seems to be all right. Uh, but we're going to follow this very, very closely. And we're going to make sure that he is back in the game as quickly as possible. Back to you. And what I was struck by, we had literally come home that day from a boot camp. And I was struck by the world it is characterized by the attempt of trying to make small stories big stories. Trying, it's sensational. It's so critical and so important, right? This is so vital that we know what's happening with that player's pinky. Like this could determine everything. And you go, that's an incredibly small story. I don't give a rip about it. It is literally inconsequential. In fact, the entire game is inconsequential. But the advertisements and the intros and the outros and the and the graphics that are done around it and the music, bum, 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 you know, it is the attempt, from my perspective, to make something sensational and significant out of the incredibly insignificant. Yeah, it's interesting, John. The other maybe version of it that strikes me too is how much that sensationalism feeds the spectator role. It's kind of the glorification of the spectator rather than the participant. I'm just aware of like, I don't watch a lot of stuff in a sense of as I'm growing and maturing in my walk with God, I find myself doing more than spectating, right? Now, it's fascinating because I love watching my kids. I was listening to Abigail play the guitar last night and I could have sat for hours going to Joshua's lacrosse tournament last weekend. I could watch him play for hours. and But it's different because there's an engagement as father, mm -hmm. whereas I just have a hard time watching things. And I think what strikes me is there's something of the world that um, has elevated the spectator. And being a spectator is very different than being in the arena in whatever form that is. Yeah, being a participant. A uh, concept that goes hand in hand with spectator, what I was thinking of is how, like, how do you make the mundane and the inconsequential seem epic? Well, it reminds me of conversations we had recently here about what it's actually like to be at a sporting event. This is not going to, you know, your son or cousin's football game. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, if you go to the thing that is a Super Bowl like experience, what is it like? Mm -hmm. And to go, it is spectacle. Like, how do you keep someone's attention? How do you try to elevate this? What you do is basically Commodus entering Rome, just to show my cards here. Of You have to do huge lights and fanfare and women and all these things like... Fireworks. Right, exactly. Again, like, calling attention away from anything that would be substantive, anything that would have sort of arresting power in its own. And in mm. the absence of that, I mean... The fascinating thing about the Super Bowl is like, you know, reading that the average segment cut is about is three to five seconds. If you actually watch the Super Bowl, like that's what you're seeing all the way through, from the time the game starts through the commercials, like with these slight interruptions of, you know, 10 seconds with the commentator, a slightly longer play. What you don't have is the delivery of anything that is actually capable of intriguing people. So instead, you go to the next set of fireworks, the next mechanical CG football player running across the screen. Now we're introducing, finally, episode four. I think one of the ways to understand the world is the artificial versus the real. That emoticons are an artificial way of relating and a really, really base one at that. It's the shortcut of the shortcut of the shortcut of the shortcut, right? And the Super Bowl making small stories try and seem epic, making the inconsequential seeming incredibly consequential. We have actually come to prefer the artificial to the real. 
And I think that's a way of getting us into today's conversation about that. So let's riff a little bit on how can we understand the world that Jesus is saying he's calling us out of with the construct of the artificial versus the real. How does that help us understand the world? I had a really interesting experience recently, a friend in from outside of town, really great guy, substantive in grad school, but trying to date. And he was relating to me his experience of trying to meet more people, like, I've gone for it, looked up what are the dating apps that people my age are using, and he's like, my watershed moment was I went into the cafe where I was going to meet this girl, and I was like, okay, I hope she recognizes me because I don't know what she's going to look like. And I'm like, you mean there's no photo? And he's like, no, the problem is that on these apps now, your average photo not just is it touched, but, you know, there are, like, emoji bunny ears on the person. There are all of these extra graphics, like, put on. And he's like, most of these people, they're almost 30. And he's like, you just don't know what they actually look like when you arrive into, like, a shared location trying to find them. And it was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> if, we hadn't, if we had got here quickly, if it hadn't been, like, the slow descent into madness, but I think if it was like, exactly. you know, it's 1985 and you, you have to like go to a speed dating service to meet people. And then like the next day we woke up and it was that there would be a little bit of reaction. But wow, what you're finding is the artificial has so taken over this world mm. of trying to meet someone for a significant relationship that you cannot do it, that you are finding it impossible when you're in the world to actually mm. find this person. Because this is a good man with a sincere effort, right? He, right. He's not trying to be weird, but it's you're saying those are the tools available. Right. Blaine, I can relate to that, not bunny ears and dating websites, but okay, I'm thinking of my day yesterday uh, because there's just nothing like starting with your own story. I think it's easier for me to maybe lob a grenade, but I have to be honest and say, well, look at my life. Yesterday, I had a very meaningful day, engaging, praying for some folks, working on some key projects, some strategic conversations, loving my kids. But what did my day actually look like? Well, I mean, it started with making coffee, but it's already ground in a bag with a little machine that you kind of put it in there and some water, you press the button. Like I actually didn't really make it, right? And then I drove to work in a vehicle that didn't require much of me. And then at work, I sat at a computer for much of the day and engaged with a screen and John, you and I had lunch outside, which was a great choice, but we actually picked up lunch that someone else made. So we gave a credit card in exchange for food that was totally prepared. We had nothing to do with it. And then I sat some more at a machine and used my phone. And But then it, after the day was over, um, I helped a buddy replace a broken window in a house. And so we are now on three stories of scaffolding and the winds were just whipping. The Chinooks were coming off the front range in these like 20 mile an hour gusts. Well, he's on top above me. So almost a fourth story. And we're trying to rip out this window and it's secure. And so we are going through stucco and wire and paper and nails and the, and the number of these heavy duty staples for the stucco. We're using a small pry bar and I cut myself and there's blood coming down. The wind's whipping the scaffolding. And then we have to get the old window out and put this new one in and everything is off balance. And it felt awesome. And just contrasting, I did very meaningful things, but they happened in such a context of artificial layers. And here, I'm just changing out a window. Yeah, That thing in of itself isn't magnificent. And yet, I felt so alive. And it felt so real, to use your word, John, because it, it required me almost to submit to something, the way things work, a natural law, and it was vulnerable. I'm thinking, you know, the scaffolding on this project has collapsed one time from the wind, three stories has come down. And I'm looking around this thing going, this could be the day it comes down again. And I felt alive. Yeah. Okay, so here's the stat I read yesterday in relation to that. We spend 93% of our lives indoors. 93% mm. of our lives indoors. That includes transportation time. In a vehicle, in a bus, on a metro. 
So you live your life in artificial lighting and in artificial weather. The thermostat, right? We literally control the weather in our homes, offices, garages, vehicles, buses, metro, whatever, okay? That is artificial surfaces, right? It's linoleum and it's plastic and it's faux marble and that kind of thing, right? Artificial smells, artificial sounds, artificial plants. We literally have plastic plants in our enclosed spaces and that's where we live 93% of our lives. Mm. Just to show like, the artificial has become so normal to us that we're not shocked that there's an app, a dating app that doesn't let you meet a real person or find a real person, and that there's emoticons that don't require real relating of you. And right, we're just so used to this. Words were line. The world is too much with it. The artificial is literally how we spend ninety three percent of our lives. Jeez. Listening to that, I'm struck by this other reality that is just a key area of interest, which is the way in all of these interesting places that the artificial is actually horrible for human beings. And there's like some really fascinating examples for that. Like the more dangerous you make roads, the fewer accidents there are on them. There's, you know, DOT studies on this that are like, if you actually make the road more demanding because it's a real difficulty to like traverse an environment. And if it's like, you know, you make the shoulders narrower, you don't make it this flat plane where everything is accounted for a few accidents. If you make cars less insulated, you have the same phenomenon. You know, futurists, business whizzes like Kevin Kelly and others sort of leading the charge on observing business deals that are made face to face succeed 80 to 90% over transactions that happened purely electronically. You got introduced to someone, something was set up online. Those actually, so you can flip it, you know, fail almost twice as often as things were like you circled up some guys for beers and built a plan together. Right. Like you have all this evidence that the artificial isn't working. Mm. Yes, powerfully doesn't work. And, well, and we know tons now about... Um, the need for nature, and I'm not going to get into that a ton this week, but to live in artificial environments and to actually prefer them. We prefer the efficiency of the digital. We prefer it to actual human interaction. This is where we're getting into the danger zone. So, you know, fake plants, okay, modicons, whatever. Like, we're just trying to point out, gang, that as you start moving into more substantive issues of the artificial, and this isn't the first time that any of us have talked about social media. And one of its primary problems is that it is artificial community. The longing is there, and we get the longing. And I understand wanting to send photos you know, to your sister who lives in Germany via social media. I get all that. I get it, okay? This isn't a total rejection, but we're just trying to ask, what does the artificial actually doing to us? To be so comfortable with it, we don't even notice it. Like the shock effect isn't there. The artificial nature of community. So pretexting, pre cell phones. There used to be this thing called a landline. It was a telephone, and, and, <laughs> and just you know, most houses had them, right? And if you couldn't, you actually had to go to a phone booth. You don't see phone booths anymore, right? There was this thing called a landline. And, and people who weren't there to receive your actual phone call had something called the answering machine. You remember the answering machine? This is just cracking me up now. And you get home and it would be flashing and it would say, you know, eight messages. And you would play, dude, hi, this is Janet. Please leave a message. You know, hi, Janet, it's mom. And you play the little message, right? Stacy and I, and we weren't alone in this because we heard friends do it too. We would say, yes, I got to leave a voicemail got to leave a voice message, right? It was the shortcut around a longer conversation and how far we've come from that, right? The shortcuts of the shortcuts of the shortcuts of the shortcuts now. And we like it that way. We like our artificial environments. And what is that doing to us? So artificial community, 
would be a far more weighty thing, I think. John, I think another category of the artificial is the artificial end product. I think one friend was talking about the world, and he named this where he said that we live in a culture, the world of perpetual summer. Perpetual summer. In other words, the season that the internet communicates to us is it's always harvest. It's always bounty. You know, Sherry went to the grocery store last week and she actually was surprised they were out of something. And she said, I can't remember how long it's been since they were out of something. And in just the shock of, then you go, what an odd sort of thing. And so I think of the artificial we're no longer connected to process and therefore the value of the thing itself. You can go to American Furniture Warehouse and get the best prices on furniture that's decent. And it's all, like we're talking about, it it all has a faux effect. It's faux wood, it's faux leather, but the price is so low and it's so convenient contrasted to the reality of doing something with your hands. You know, Blaine, I was helping you move and I just loved looking at some of these pieces of, let's call it furniture, of bookshelves. And it was clearly wood assembled with screws by your own hands. And it had substance to it. I've been working on this barn wood. Sherry's parents tore down an old barn out in the Midwest. And they said, hey, you can have it if you want it. And we we're thinking there's some cool things we could do with it. And up to this point, barn wood was an idea of different pieces or different finishes but it wasn't a reality. Well, this is my first time I had to deal with reality. And so fast forward, I've spent seven full days of my life contending with this barn. And it started with a 14 hour trip in snowstorm with a U-Haul trailer to load it up, to take it apart section by section, to bring it back, to disassemble. Three days of just pulling nails, 100 year old rusted nails, and then working in a friend's shop a wood shop. I haven't been in a wood shop since seventh grade of milling where I'm using a joiner and using a planer until I have finished lumber that's a hundred year old. And the point is that lumber is so valuable to me. It's so real because of the cost. But I realized I disdained the process. Do you remember we were in a mutual friend's house a number of years ago, very wealthy man, great guy, great guy, loves God, very wealthy guy who had built this phenomenal ranch house and it it had all this distressed wood inside, Mm -hmm. right? And we're like, oh my gosh, where did you get that gorgeous distressed wood? You know, and the answer is I bought it, right? Right. It's Wyoming Snow Fence. It's literally a Wyoming Snow Fence company. They put it up, they let the snow distress it through a Wyoming winter and then they sell it, right? And this guy simply had it installed. Yes. I mean, you could go into distressed jeans and distressed right. jackets, and it's the appearance of character mm. without the process. Yes. Is what that is. I had another really disturbing experience with uh, another set of wealthy friends. And this isn't this isn't anything against wealth, gang. I know people of of means that do phenomenal work in the world. So it's not this isn't about that. It just happens to be that going to the Ritz Carlton in Beaver Creek. Colorado is an experience. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's an experience. And the thing is, is it is sumptuous. Everything is wonderful. Mm. Everything is wonderful. And the message is everything is wonderful. Everything can be wonderful. But the disturbing thing to me was observing the women that I would call a very mature age. I want to say between 70 and 80, who were trying to look like they were 20. The hair's dyed, the Botox, they've had the surgeries, you know, this, that, and other places. They're wearing the hip clothes, you know, they're starving themselves to have the 20-year-old aerobic instructor figure. And, And what I was watching was artificial youth. Glad you sort of built that example up because you can look at the development of it. And I think like there's the furthest extreme, which is that person you pass in the grocery store who like has perfect skin and blonde hair, but you are just absolutely convinced that she's probably 70 years old and like feel this weird thing in you respond. But that's not the only stop on the way of this artificial youth, beauty, power. Like, 
there's just all the variations down the way of you can have the body of someone who works with their body for 10 minutes a day, like, on whatever it is. Like, you can have the appearance of the person who has loved playing sports, but you don't have to invest in becoming a sports athlete. That takes so much time. And there's this sort of holding out to us that we can have and live in, like, beauty, power, especially the promise of youth, especially like the adoration of the sort of possibility, the immortality of youth without being young or strong or using our bodies for anything other than packaging to get our brains to work or using our hands for anything else than typing. Like it's this swap of actually those things can be real and good things in their spot, but they are meant to happen inside particular lifestyles. And like it's the pulling out that you just begin to look at, obviously, the person with the Botox seems weird. Something is provoked in me. Mm -hmm. But it's worth pointing out how often I ride a training bike, even when it's warm outside, Mm. because it's so much faster. Like, I can ride a bike for 30 minutes versus 15 minutes because I don't have to put my gear on. I don't have to deal with tires. I'm not going to get hit by a car. But at the same time, it is this, like, strong, but not in the space of actually having to contend with a hill. Yeah. So in some of the men's magazines I subscribe to, there'll be these ads. Let's throw it at the dudes now, because we're not just picking on women. You'll see these ads with these older guys. And if you buy the M formula, if you buy the substitute, you know, testosterone product X, Y, and Z, if you do this particular workout plan, you know, killer abs in three weeks, or and and you always have the older man with the younger woman, right? So here is the beautiful woman expression of youth with the older guy who is not young anymore, but he's trying to act like it. He's trying to hang on to it. He's using medicine and science and pharmaceuticals and surgeries himself. And let's be honest, artificial gyms. You know, I mean, you go into a gym, it's artificial. That whole workout, you're on machines in front of screens, in front of other screens, in a climate controlled environment. So, anyway, you see these guys, and I'm repulsed by it. I'm repulsed. I'm like, when I'm 70, I don't want the abs of a 22-year-old college football player. Like, that is it's gross. And what you see in it is you see the flight from reality. The world is characterized by the flight from reality. And so trying to create community, when there, there isn't community there, gang. That, that's not community, right? I embarrassing story the guy shared with me the other day was he was online in a social community with a bunch of people with a professor that they had loved from college. He knew that the professor had died three months ago, but it was his birthday. And, you know, Facebook lets you know, boot, it's, you know, so-and-so's birthday. So everyone was sending birthday wishes and greetings to someone who was dead. And just showing the artificial nature of community. Like, that's not community, gang. That doesn't work. And that's not youth, gang. The corner I want to turn right now is reality is a good thing. Reality is actually to be preferred. Reality was meant to shape us. Reality is good for you. And I had shared in an earlier episode kind of Sherry's story about going into the store. And I just don't think anything of it that I can get blueberries 365 days a year. I just don't think anything of it. And how bizarre that is, how completely unnatural that is. And the flight from reality there is we don't have to pray for rain. We don't have to pray that the crops come through this year. I mean, in every single century before this one— Humanity was very aware of our dependence on God. Reality was this constant reminder of, oh, please, please bless this this wheat crop this year. You know, not only do we need it, but the community needs it. You know, our our livestock needs the grass to grow. And, you know, like you were connected to a reality. But it happened to me the other day. I went in to my grocery store and they were out of blueberries. And that thing in me was ticked. 
There was just that. Hey, you're entitled to them. I was, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, this is absurd, <laughs> right? It, reality is a good thing. What I so appreciate, as you say that, it that story reveals these fundamental building blocks of reality, like dependency is a good thing. The world teaches us, it shapes us to be independent, to be not dependent on anything. But in that story, what you're saying is reality says, no, we are very dependent beings, and that is good for our soul. Because, because what I said in the introduction was, the world is shaped by fallen humanity trying to make life work without God. Okay, so we can make life work without God through science, medicine, yes. technology, whatever, right. right? And therefore, we don't have to be dependent. Exactly. Well, meanwhile, you, so then you go back into the scriptures. If the scriptures are truly pointing us to life where the epistle says, outwardly, we are wasting away. And yet, inwardly, we are being made new. We are being renewed. So the fact is, youth is not our future. Youth was our past, right? And so reality and that's actually a good thing. Mm. That's the shocking. Right. That's the shocking truth. Right. Well, you told the story of the grotesque nature of a 70-year-old man trying to act 30. Let me contrast that. There's an elder, a sage in my life who used to be a very competitive athlete, pro level Iron Man's, and now he's in his 60s and he still loves fitness. And he made a comment to me. He said, every year, I know it's a sure thing. I'm going to get slower. He said, my peak performance is behind me. He said, but I love getting out there. And, and what it was an example of is the fitness is from God, the desire to be well and whole, but it wasn't subject to the artificial youth, right? It was submitted to reality. So I think what helps me as you say that is there is a path of life. What I'm seeing is that there is a way through the pollution of the world. But I flinch when you say reality is a good thing because I was pissed when I was working on that window yesterday and I cut my hand and I was going, man, this isn't a good day to do it. Why the heck? Yes. I, my ego, my flesh is feeling yes. those things. I don't want reality yeah. really. Yeah. Blaine, why is reality a good thing? So many thoughts come up in response because you, you range from like the very obvious ways, like, you know, studies on the cortisol reducing effects of being outside, but not like dabbling outside, like it actually takes wilderness or things like the observed phenomenon that like creativity is shaped by limitations, not just in the way that the artist accepts the limitations of their medium, how fast their paint is going to dry what it's going to require to mix these colors. But also there's a very fascinating thing that artists are wary of and creatives are wary of, but it is that their best work happened when they had the most limitations on their life. Like a playwright whose early work I really like, David Mamet, who now like got famous, bought the land in the country in the East Coast, converted a farm into his, like the old farm building into his writing studio and the guy writing about his life was like, he now enjoys the privileged position of being able to write from comfort, whatever creative thing. But like his glory days are behind him as he has removed himself from reality, as he has removed himself from having to grapple with even like the limitations of you can't have everything you want. You don't have enough money, like a little bit of reality providing help to people. We talk about this a lot around here. The way that your heart comes alive, the human heart comes alive in reality in the face of all of the inconveniences. And it's so irritating to me that like the inefficiency of time, the inefficiency of these tasks. And yet there is something, as you were talking about Morgan with replacing the window, that comes alive in us is actually made for the reality, like not just psychologically, but soulfully of the real world. Yes, and, the, and its requirements on it, which is the world that God gave us, right? Not the world that man is inventing to try and live apart from God and make 
perpetual Eden, perpetual youth, perpetual happiness, whether it's summer or winter, it's whatever, what is your perpetual happiness? Life's always good. There are no seasons. You don't need to be unhappy through any portion of your day, let alone your week or month or year. Like we can eradicate all of that. We don't need God. Whereas reality just continues to introduce this beautiful, beautiful the presence of God into our lives. I have a treadmill because we live in Colorado, and some days you just can't get outside to get exercise. A lot of the days of winter, you can't. But the difference between running inside on a treadmill, looking at the artificial plants, I have them in that room, okay, versus taking a walk in the woods, there's simply no comparison. Like, immediately you're outside, all kinds of things begin to happen to you. And encountering God is in all of that. God is in nature. God is not in plastic plants. God is in weather. He is not in your HVAC and your thermostat, right? God is in real relationship and what it requires of us. And I remember before I got married, I was a very freewheeling spirit. I was a free spirit. I got kicked out of high school. I, you know, I was a wild. And, and I'd jump in my Volkswagen square back and I'd just go. Go to Montana, go to Joshua Tree and climb. Just go. Go, you know, go to the beach and sleep on the beach at night because we wanted to get up in the morning and and be there. Like, and as I got married, first massive, you know, disruption to the self as the epicenter of the world. But then as we had children, and as we had young children, I was really straining under surrendering that old life. And I wish I could credit the author, I think it was Chesterton, who said, These are blessed constraints. They are blessed constraints. And learning to love another human being, learning to navigate a family of human beings. In fact, I, it was Chesterton, he was saying the difference between joining a club and having a family is, you know, you pick your club and everyone who's in the club is like you. And so you're not shaped by it. The family says you are thrown into it by God and you have to deal with what you find there. And so real community, as opposed to emoticons, real conversations, as opposed to texting or voicemail or a quick email, right, requires things of us. And that is a good thing. God is in that. He is not in the artificial. Gang, we recognize that this is a really uncomfortable conversation, and we are uncomfortable with it. We are uncomfortable with how much we are actually a part of the world that Jesus said he's actually calling us out of. He says, I have chosen you out of the world, and that is why you do not belong to it. Now, I don't mean kindness, care, compassion. I don't mean being concerned about, you know, global movements or economies. or not. That's not what we're saying. There is this thing, capital T, the, capital W, world, that the Scripture is very, very strong about. And, yep, it's pretty disruptive to begin to shake it and look at it next week we're going to talk about what it means to, to live in a healthy way toward the world and how we can begin to make meaningful choices. But right now, I think it's good to be uncomfortable with this, to be shook by how much the flight from reality actually characterizes most of our day and much of our priorities and our values looking for an artificial community, an artificial youth, an artificial sense of meaning making small stories seem like big ones, and artificial sense of self, artificial sex, in, in all the ways that people are pursuing it. Like, holy cow, the world is messed up, and I don't want to be shaped by it anymore. We're going to come back next week and pick up the conversation. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast, Episode 4, On the World, with Morgan Snyder, Blaine and John Eldridge.